Hello and welcome to the Airline Business Podcast, discussing key news and trends in the global airline sector. This time, more change for Norwegian as its pioneering co-founder and chief steps down, while one of the possible successors to Michael O'Leary at Ryanair is moving on, and the scramble to succeed Jet Airways in India continues. We look at the winners and stories from this year's Airline Strategy Awards, and at what our annual World Airline Rankings tell us about the state of the industry. And we also look at the job facing the new man at the helm of Korean Air. My name's Graham Dunn, and after the fun and games of running around the Paris Air Show, I'm joined back in our luxurious studio here in London by my airline business colleague, Lewis Harper. Hi, Graham. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. It's been a um, another busy few weeks, and it's nice to be back in our uh, palatial surroundings here after... Um, Running around in Paris, yeah, that that I think it, it went quite well, but it was a it was a challenging couple of days trying to you know record my thoughts and your thoughts and the thoughts of some of our journalists as we were rushing around the Bourget. So, like you say, nice to be back in our soundproof studio. And and we were at least grateful to miss the heat wave the following week of um, yeah, of yeah. Paris, which would have been um, yeah that would have added a, a new level of challenge maybe. Yeah. So just as we're uh, recording here last um, week, there was quite a big development around Norwegian with uh, Bjorn Kjors uh, moving on. Yeah, so um, maybe not not that surprising. I guess he's he's one of the oldest CEOs um, or was one of the oldest CEOs in the industry. Um, so he, he's moving on. He's not completely stepping away from Norwegian. I think he's still going to be in an advisory role for the um, the chairman there. But but um, we don't know his successor. I think the CFO, um, Gear Carlson, has stepped in temporarily. I don't know if he's um, up for the job permanently, but they've said they've started looking. I think the, the, the most interesting thing really is what, what this might mean for Norwegian, whether it's... Um, because cause cost was stayed on longer than he I think he wanted to didn't he because of the IIG yeah, um, interest and, and he obviously was uh, Norwegian's been a it's, I mean, it's a fascinating airline I mean the name suggests you know starts as a small domestic regional carrier mm. in Norway and has expanded into this um, uh, pan-European I mean, it's already uh, mm. expanding in that low cost model well beyond Norway yeah. uh, under Kjors's leadership and then he then embarks on this major long haul uh, operations mm. yeah and, and those are the um the, the kind of a, a big focus for them obviously as you say is that that long haul um operation and and we, we talked a lot about the fact it's not you know you can't really say of any confidence that model is is definitely working they've you know they've tried a lot of different routes they they've obviously at the same time they've had the inconvenience of the, the max situation mm. the issues with the dreamliners as well so so yeah there's a lot up in the air but having said that there's a lot of people who are very keen to say norwegian was has been on the verge of collapse for for years now but it, it, it's kept going hasn't it it's and, kept going and and i think that the, probably the change comes at a time where you know the company has this very stated aim now are changing from uh, from growth towards profitability hmm. they i mean they have grown incredibly quickly um yeah their, their figures always stand out when we look at capacity year on year the last few years norwegian always you know well into the double figures on that and that that yeah that that has to end really um and the, yeah that seems sensible they're kind of focusing on that getting costs down and and focusing on on, on the profitability side of things rather than that that and you, and yeah, and you've already seen uh, with Norwegian. There's uh, and they talked more about it in their um, second quarter results, which you know there was there were signs of some encouragement. It's always um, quite difficult to tell across you know, until you get the whole year, and especially going into the, the slightly harder winter months. But uh, they, you know there were signs of progress in their cost cutting. They, they'd um, they've reined back capacity. We've seen you know quite a lot of, of churn in their routes, and they, they you know and clearly they're thinking now the time. Uh, it, is to try and consolidate where they've got to. That's right. And um, the other thing that it is interesting, I suppose, is whether his departure might might mean a softening towards a sale. You, you, you don't know. I mean, as I say, he's not stepping completely away, but um, you never know what, what, what they might have in mind and what the, the new person may be brought in to, to deliver. And just ahead of... Um, so IAG, of course, it's British Airways mm. parent... Um, uh, they obviously made approaches um, last year, about a year or so ago, um, uh, over a possible bid, which was uh, rebuffed. And Norwegian mm. had quite a good summer, which maybe mm. uh, emboldened them a little bit. 
uh, they had more challenges as the winter came and secured some more investment. But it's interesting now, uh, even before the announcement of Kiosk moving on uh, last week, there was there were more talk and roof speculation about IOG uh, returning with another yeah. bid in some form. You know, it, it is very difficult to say. I think Norwegian will remain a a really interesting carrier for people to watch. Mm. Um, and uh, a lot, of the, you know, partly because of that market is greater, but also, you know, a lot of the the assets it has in terms of um, that the aircraft, it has its fleet, the um, the slots and the order book, I guess. That's it, yeah. It's certainly a force in its own right. And I think um, the, what COS has achieved is is you know, creating a, a disruptive force that has endured, as we were saying, in a way that you you perhaps, you know, a lot of people were would, would have... Um, you know, had them falling over years ago. So um, yeah, there's um, there's there's something there. But yeah, and they've they've resolved their short short term funding challenges. So um, we'll wait and see because, um, as you say, the new the new person may put them on a slightly different route. But um, but it and and it is very and it's very interesting when you have airlines that are led by uh, or really driven by by um, a one man or a personality of mm. of, of sort. And beyond course, you know, he's not. Um, uh, he's a very in- interesting character, but he, he, he's not someone who was... He wasn't a Michael O'Leary trying to, you know, get the limelight and, and mm. so forth, not specifically front of house. Norwegian's plan development has very much been his mm. his ambition and his drive. Yeah, and you wonder whether the, the, the new new CEO might be someone, you know, from outside the country, for example. So, um, yeah, again, it'd be very interesting to see. Um, there's a few names you, you can think of that, that might be up for that, but yeah, we equally wouldn't be surprised if if one of the the, the current senior executives mm. took took that step step up. But um, as you say, he's he's got a colourful past with his he used to be a fighter pilot and a novelist, I mm-hmm. think. Um, so, um, but as you say, actually, in terms of how he presented himself as CEO, he he was sort of much more in the background than, than as you say, the kind of Willy Walsh kind of O'Leary yeah. type character. And, and O'Leary is interesting because at, at, at Ryanair, that, that again mm. has been... Um, so the succession of Michael O'Leary, that's something that's been talked about. When O'Leary himself has for years talked about being, mm. oh, probably just a few years away. And then <laughs> he, 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 signed, he signed on for another yeah, five years, I think, right, a, yeah. a, a year or so ago. Um but as part of that, you know, there's very much this look at, you know, finding a successor, who might um, mm. come on board, even if that's just us wondering. Yes. I, I, I think that, that Ryan and themselves have been looking at it. Mm. And one of the people who we, we would certainly have thought might have been in the frame for that, uh, Peter Bello, yeah. um, he's announced he's, uh, or he's to leave as yeah, well. Yeah, so he's going to go at the end of the year, I think. Um, I kind of thought it was a bit of a shoe in that he would take that because um, obviously Ryanair have gone through that or going through that restructuring where O'Leary is kind of the Willie Walsh equivalent, the group chief, and we're expecting a new kind of CEO of the Ryanair mainline operation, if you like. And it, it felt like um, Bello would be the kind of shoe in for that. His past, obviously, he was CEO of Malaysia Airlines. He'd worked at Ryanair before that. Um, we don't know why he's gone. He's going at the end of the year, so it's not a, an immediate departure. But and, um, and and his mission when he came in was very much he was he was in charge of the um, of dealing with with his operations, getting that back mm. on track after the pilot rostering woes. That's it. And he, I guess uh, certainly from the outside looking in, he seems to have achieved that. Mm. They're not expecting or have they haven't experienced any kind of those rostering problems. Um, they're big fans of going on about the problems created by ATC um, in Europe, but um, obviously Belly's not not going to be able to influence that. So certainly he appears to have done a decent job, and maybe it was all, always kind of that sh- that short term vision mm. for that role. And um, yeah, I don't know whether he's retiring or if he's got other plans. But yeah, as I think a lot of people thought he was kind of um, he would definitely obvious, would O'Leary definitely be one of, of the options yeah. for that role. So that becomes interesting to see where um... yeah yeah. So there's um, We've got that that role available. We've got the uh, the Norwegian role. There's a few names around. So you look at, I mean, Christoph Müller, someone who obviously left Emirates a few a few months ago. He's, he's a name that. Um, he's a, um, so the former Aer Lingus chief yeah. um, and uh, Thomas Cook. I think he was a uh, yes. Um, so. Previously, and he's worked worked well across. We certainly would expect mm. him to appear somewhere uh, at yes. some point. But there's been no um, uh, no sign where he's going. Um, no, so. Um, yeah, there's a few names. We've got the um, talking about vacancies as well. Obviously, uh, South African Airways is another one that has a 
a vacancy at the moment. Um, they've got a, an acting chief in the role at the moment. That's a particularly challenging uh, position, I think, for someone if they if they the, if they want that. But um, that remains a, a very tough role. Uh, yeah. Very interestingly, in there that um, uh, South Africa was sort of a series of acting chief chief mm. executives prior to that, um, which included uh, the former head of uh, Mango, uh, mm. Nico. For Sweden, Hoot. Yes. I don't think that's how you pronounce <laughs> it. I just call him Nico. Um, yeah. And he he served twice as um, SAA's acting uh, chief executive, and and then then moved away uh, to to work at FastJet, and as um, which turned out to be another challenging yes, <laughs> challenging yeah. job. He, he gives himself some tough jobs, and he's now come heading back. So he's heading back to Mango, so he'll be mm. part of the the low cost operation there. So mm. interesting times ahead, SAA. As with with a number of African carriers, it, it's a struggle to really fulfil the potential that there is. Um, yeah, because it fell out under Girana, he had um, stabilised things to a point. Obviously, mm. there are massive funding challenges in the in the short term there, and um, I don't think they've been resolved. But I know the unions were particularly upset about him going. I think there's a perception now that the kind of old guard who are responsible for this the mess that SAA is in. <laughs> maybe coming back into <laughs> into the kind of senior roles there so um so yeah if, if anyone <laughs> wants a particularly big challenge i think that's one to go that's for a, but but yeah it's certainly been interesting to see we're gonna have a different picture in some of them um, some of the biggest airlines and um, we, we cover i think soon with in terms of who's leading them so yeah and with um and elsewhere it there's been a lot of um uh, running stories that have continued in, in in much the same way. Obviously, we've had the max grounding, which mm. continues. I mean, um, there's lots of change, yeah. Because if there's the IAG order at Paris was a bit of a distraction. It kind of um, you know gave Boeing a sort of a, a small window of mm. positive coverage around the max. But very quickly, you're seeing you know, US carriers are kind of putting out their schedules for later in the year, and you know it's being pushed back the max sort of, isn't going to be uh, there and. Push back to October. Yeah. Now you're getting to the stage of, of of when that will come back, and and, and the hopes of that coming back over the summer. That obviously now seems. Um, I think this year would be surprising. Now the way mm. the way things are looking, I think. So there's there's mm. plenty there, and in India we've had Jet Airways remains a challenge that's that's been grounded now for it's over mm. three months. Um, they've gone uh, attempts to try and. Uh, get that carrier to, fly, uh, mm. to rise again. Have gone into a, a formal um, restructuring process. They want to try and rush that through, and I think or fast track through if they can, and come to some kind of resolution. And I think because you are seeing more and more carriers moving in, mm. um, filling that void. Um, a lot of the the rights have been have been handed out, albeit on a still, I think, a temporary basis. Yeah. Um, but as those operators get uh, more established on those routes, it, it, you know, the longer jet stays grounded, mm. the harder it, it would become for any... Um, Precisely. It feels like, I mean, you, you, you can see online, if you look, you've got SpiceJet flying an aircraft around with jet livery and just SpiceJet written mm. in small letters on the side. Yeah, they're, they're, like you say, the, the challenge with you know, resurrecting jet, <laughs> if it isn't enough, yeah, so many of their competitors have taken taken the you know, ground and I think um, if a relaunch jet would probably sort of be starting from scratch in many ways obviously it's, it's some of its international services would probably be the lucrative ones that yes. they'd probably go in on but certainly um, did a huge job to do um, to, to claw back what they've lost e- even just in the last couple of months really so and another story we've been following um, in Canada uh, there's been a lot of uh, movement there with um, the private equity bid for WestJet and then for Air Transat hmm. as the as, um, there was a, uh, a bid and in fact a rival bid but Air Canada is getting that one over the line. That's right so they've, they've taken on Air Transat's a kind of a leisure focused operation it kind of strengthens their Air Canada in that market at a time when I guess WestJet, one of its biggest competitors, is is very much um, remarketing itself as a, as a network carrier so moving away from its um, low cost kind of focus in the past so the competitive environment there um, is interesting and I guess this this kind of combined force of Air Canada and Air Transat will place you know, both of them better to to meet that and the Canadian market is interesting and wider as well because there's a lot of ultra low cost carriers moving into the market so a lot of upheaval there and um, and probably a timely uh, investment there for Air Canada just to shore up the defences on, on everything going on. Absolutely. So that's uh, enough for 
part one, we'll be uh, back in the second part where we're going to talk about the Airline Strategy Awards. If you're enjoying the Airline Business Podcast, get new episodes automatically sent to your phone by subscribing through your podcast platform of choice. So, Sunday the 14th of July was a day of high drama in the UK. We had the Wimbledon final, the British Grand Prix and the Cricket World Cup final. But all of those were trumped by this year's Airline Strategy Awards, which took place in London. So all eyes were on the Honourable Artillery Club as the best and brightest from the world's airlines collected awards across eight categories, all ably overseen by our colleague Max Kingsley-Jones, who donned his Elvis wig again for the second time at one of these events. And uh, that's an excellent reason on its own to check out all the videos and pictures from the night at strategyawards.com. One of the biggest winners last night was Lufthansa CEO Carsten Spohr, who took home the Executive Leadership Award. Spohr has guided Lufthansa to a position of strength during his time in charge, but the group is not without its challenges. So Graham, uh, Spohr is a worthy winner, but in, in terms of the timing, um, we had some pretty big news about Eurowings, didn't we, just, uh, <laughs> just a couple of weeks before he, he picked up the award? Absolutely. It, I mean, it's, the, the story around Lufthansa is really interesting and around sports really interesting. Almost difficult to remember so much has happened in that uh, mm. uh, that German market. These first couple of years were involved, you know, quite a, a standoff with the, with the unions, uh, um, a lot of industrial action, really, tr- you know, working very hard to try and get their cost base back into, mm. uh, into step. And... Uh, you know, and, and he'd achieved quite a lot of that groundwork, and then with the collapse of Air Berlin, which you know it was it was clear that that was coming. They were all, uh, Lufthansa themselves had already taken steps to sort of try and work closer with the carrier to sort of take advantage of opportunities. But there's something the carrier had to do something because there's this mm. huge, um, huge rival which collapses on your on your doorstep, and you're left with either someone else is going to fit, move in, which has been very clear that. Mm. that low-cost carriers in particular would move in into that market, or you have to do it yourself. And the way they did it was quite interesting in terms of Eurowings, um, so the you know, large expansion of a uh, massive expansion at Eurowings. Mm. Um, but that brings with it some, some challenges. The likes of Ryanair and EasyJet haven't, haven't stepped away from the challenge. No, and no. and the, the German market and, um, and perhaps the Austrian market is extremely uh, competitive. Yeah, and um, 2018 for Eurowings in particular was a tough one. So they had um, a lot of disruption, uh, particularly in the summer season. They were trying to integrate those new um, Air Berlin assets. They, you know, a very kind of mixed fleet of, of aircraft they were having to handle suddenly. So it wasn't a, an easy period. It wasn't was it? an easy period. And then yeah. doing it at a time when um, there were, in, in Germany in particular, in the uh, Karlsbad, Corridor, I think it is, mm. as if I know anything about air traffic management. <laughs> Karlsruhe, is it? Karlsruhe. Karlsruhe. Yes, yeah. is it Karlsruhe? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't could know have been, what could have been, could have been Karlsberg. <laughs> Probably a beer, yeah. Um, so they have this, uh, you know, large uh, disruption to the to the services on top of their own challenges. You know, that was a that was a difficult year for Eurowings taking all that on board, and mm. and you know, again, rather like Norwegian, they're taking a, they're starting to take a step and think. Having done that expansion, now how do we secure the the operation, make it more profitable? And it's another example, maybe where the, the low cost long haul model is sort of being almost abandoned, really, in that change, isn't it? They're kind of moving euro wings. Maybe it makes more sense for in their structure is going to focus on on the short haul, but those kind of uh, long haul routes that euro wings were were flying are going to move back into the mainline operations. Um, the other interesting thing is Brussels Airlines. That that was. I never we I could never we could never get a good answer really on on how Brussels mm. Airlines was ultimately going to be integrated into Eurowings. It didn't. You know, it's a network carrier fitting into this low cost group, and I think and now they're saying Brussels will kind of continue as a a separate entity. So that that ambition to integrate Brussels into that is also ending, and I think that does make more sense mm. really, doesn't it, in terms of the the structure when you look at how Swiss and um, Austrian, for example, operate within that group. There's a, Absolutely. There's a certain precedent there, yeah. And I think one of the, one of the things that the, the judges, so we have, uh, a, there's a panel of judges who, who decide these awards. We're lucky enough to um, to be there on the night when the, mm. when the discussion's going on. And, and, and I think one of the things that came, came across in the judge's thinking was really this there was a bravery about Lufthansa it didn't step away from the challenge of, of doing this so Costin's yeah. taken on you know what what's not an easy opportunity nobody would probably choose to to fast track um, 
uh, you know, in an ideal world, you wouldn't, bringing all those assets in is a major challenge. Mm. Uh, doing it in those circumstances, but I think it was, um, you know, faced with with not doing that or faced with mm. conceding that ground. Mm. And and as I say, if you look at how um, EasyJet in Berlin and, and Ryanair through a louder motion, or just louder as it is now how they've moved in, you know, it's absolutely clear something had to be done. Mm. Um, so, you know, and throughout it all, whilst Eurowings has had some challenges profit-wise, Lufthansa and the group as a whole, you know, it's an, been another strong profitable year for them. They've kind of uh, reaped the, the the benefit of the work of the wider group that has mm. uh, that has been done. So kind of, so it was. I think it was probably, a, you know, a, a timely recognition for yeah. Lufthansa and Carsten, even though Eurowings has some some more more challenges still to come and uh obviously carsten spool was was at the uh, the event to pick up pick up the award a really interesting acceptance speech he um he talked about kind of there used to be three important stakeholders in lufthansa group so the passengers employees shareholders and now he's saying there's a fourth which is the environment so a bit of a theme in particularly in europe in the past few months is um is carriers uh, i suppose trying to find a slightly different narrative on on the environment maybe accepting um slightly more openly that that you know aviation does contribute significantly to 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 climate change and that you know something needs to be done about that and um, obviously an extreme example is klm um with peter elba suggesting you know people might and sas as well actually that people might want to fly less because um because of the environmental impact but it was certainly intriguing there to see um Carsten Spohr using that that moment to to highlight the importance of the environment. He got a big round of applause in the room. I think he he kind of he, he wasn't you know um, he, he was fairly robust in his messaging as well, saying almost that airlines have to prove that um, you know that two point five percent or whatever of um, carbon emissions that come from aviation are actually worth it, and that the airlines have got a strong story to tell about why. Why that's necessary, and he was he was very interesting. At uh, he was speaking at uh, the IELTA AGM at the press conference afterwards, and he was uh, one of the things he mentioned was the in terms of what happens to the argument. He acknowledged that you know does it help when airlines are uh, selling tickets for five dollars, uh, you know five dollars a seat, you know so that yeah. that doesn't help aviation or help airlines in making an argument when no. I- I- if you're selling seats selling uh, tickets at you know below any mm. obvious la- value f- for them or the cost of it so yeah um so it's interesting thoughts and i think it certainly plays into this um what we've seen we saw it at paris and we've seen it the environment is moving up senior leaders um agendas they they know mm. they they can't they can't ignore it. They know they have to talk about it. Whether they can act fast enough, there's so much momentum on it. it you know, it's very difficult for them to to catch up on. Yeah. Um, but whether it's the airlines, whether it's airframers, uh, whether it's airports, you know, nobody nobody doesn't talk about it now, and mm. and that has to be a good thing. Yeah, and I get the sense that Europe's going to be a bit of a leader on this. I think in the US, for example, there's fewer alternative options to flying in terms of public transport for example but i guess in europe there's a fairly decent rail network certainly in some countries so there's it's kind of i think the momentum's building more quickly in europe and that like a lot of these things will probably spread eventually but um but it's certainly intriguing and just an aside obviously we saw talking about the optics of these things we saw emirates launch um just a couple of weeks ago its shortest ever a380 flight so it's flying an a380 from dubai to muscat which is I think a four-hour drive. I mean, it's a forty-minute flight, but but certainly it, it put that release out as um, you know without any reference to the environment, which is fair enough. And I don't know um, you know how that would compare, for example, to flying three or four smaller aircraft mm. on that route. But it's certainly an interesting that that kind of thing um, kind of um, clashed a bit, I think, with the message we're getting from KLM, for example, about the responsible flying on these short-haul routes. And it's something to to look out, keep an eye on in future. I think. So Costum wasn't the only winner. We had um, a series of uh, awards that were given out last night. And you... Yeah, I spoke to... So we give out an airline business award, so that's one we decide on within the airline business team. Um, that went to, to Bill Frankie of Indigo Partners. Um, we have we chatted to Bill before um, the event, and I had a quick chat with him last night at the event as well. So And we'll be um, doing a lot more coverage of what he had to say, I think, in 
in future issues of airline business. But certainly um, very intriguing because um, Indigo Partners placed a um, well, one of the, the, the groups to place an order for the XLR, A321 XLR at the Paris Air Show. So they're going into three of their, their airlines, including Frontier. Um, interesting, I asked him directly, are, the, are we going to start seeing Frontier fly you know, transatlantic, for example? And I think the answer was was no well then maybe he wouldn't say if, it, <laughs> if they were but certainly i think um yeah it, it, it can transcontinental routes for example for frontier are, um are ideal for the xlr so um so some interesting stuff on that and on um they work in some intriguing markets so um asked about there were rumors they were interested in avianca brazil at one point for example and he was saying it's a it's a difficult market to get into you know it's a different lang dif- different language in in Brazil, for example, compared with the rest of Latin America, so um, and it's a it's one I think that, that they'll certainly be looking at. We're asking about Wow Air as well, um, and um, I think and while they had some interest in that before it collapsed, I think the the feeling might be that certainly with these the new aircraft like the XLR coming in, um, maybe the the need to, to you know do a sort of kangaroo kangaroo route via um, Reykjavik isn't isn't quite so so strong now. So some interesting stuff, and as I say, will be. There'll be lots more on that, I think, maybe in in the next issue of Airline Business. So, um, and just other awards on the night, we had Martin Gauss from Air Baltic. So that was for sector leadership. Yeah, Martin's done a tremendous job at Air Baltic, which is a Latvian carrier, and that's been sort of very difficult for carriers to, to grab any kind of hold there. Mm. Um, they've really uh, worked well in in becoming the, the the primary operator in that region. Yeah. Um, on the low cost front, Jetstar, the um, Qantas unit. Yeah, so the old um, airline within an airline, which has um, proved a challenge for a lot. We're just talking about Eurowings, for example, but you know, um, Jetstar have, have kind of quietly gone on with um, growing, you know, pretty significantly over over the years in in the Australian market and beyond. And um, I think a well deserved recognition of what what they've achieved there. You know, beginning with Alan Joyce, who obviously stepped up to take on the the Qantas role overall. But yeah, so yeah, well deserved there. Um, we had uh, Delta on finance, a fairly formidable force there, and it kind of focused on their equity partnerships and investments, that kind of and thing. And that's, that's, they're a very successful example of, I mean, there have been some less successful uh, yes. equity uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, strategies, but you, you can see where that's coming coming from. Um, in the uh, We have a marketing category, well, for two marketing categories, I guess, guess but they would, uh, well, no. Yeah. One market, one outright marketing in terms of uh, which, yeah. uh, WestJet. WestJet, and that's just as we were talking about earlier. Really, it's um that that kind of marketing push away from viewing WestJet as this low cost carrier and into a, a full service carrier, backed up by the 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 launch of seven eight seven nines into into Europe from Canada. So um, the, the whole campaign around that, and generally WestJet, I think, is an airline that during these judging discussions has always been it's kind of a bit unlucky early. probably in the past not to have got it so um so i think a timely recognition there of the, the stuff you do around even around christmas where they have their blue santa who <laughs> kind of travels around airports and uh, and yeah so they're, they're very much um kind of innovators in that that kind of area so well deserved there and digital innovation was easyjet a carrier which has won a few times recently at the strats and and again um they're kind of seen as a market leader in that area so um one example is their Look and Book app, where you can, and they developed it with Instagram, where you can take a, find a photo of something that looks great, and then um, the, the app kind of finds flights to that place, essentially um, using the EasyJet app. So um, some decent usership levels on that as well. So, um, and then for a first at this awards was um, our diversity and leadership, which went to Air Canada, and um, yeah, so. And a, a good story there, really. Um, next time we'll talk a bit more about the, the diversity side of things because we'll have our annual survey of um, of women in in leadership roles. But certainly, um, and obviously, diversity isn't just about that. But um, Air Canada does excel in that that regard. And um, the work I've done already on that survey shows they um, one of the few carriers where a sort of fifty fifty split in the the very tops sort of leadership roles between men and women so a well-deserved recognition there absolutely well. and with all those stories we've sort of flown through them a little bit there but you can find out much more about them about the uh, event itself and we have little write-ups on on why each of those was chosen at um uh, uh, strategyawards.com and as if that wasn't enough we whilst we've been doing that we've um we've also been doing our annual uh, world airline rankings mm. basically uh, almost an audit i guess but or a listing of 
of the biggest airlines by a number of different metrics, both traffic and, and finance. And it's a good sort of health check um, mm. operation for the state of the industry. I think you need a health check after <laughs> the, the effort you have to go to to put that together. There's quite a lot of, yeah. um, there's quite a lot of number crunching going mm. on there, and it, it gets... It does get a bit confusing yeah. <laughs> as the process goes by. And uh, and one of the things, it's always difficult to tell the, these things. You know, it seems like quite a simple question, who, who's the biggest airline in the world mm. or what's the most successful airline in the world? But, of course, it does depend how you measure it. Is it by, yeah. uh, even if it's, you know, is it by traffic or is it by revenues or is it by profit? Mm. And even if you decide it's traffic, is it by, by the RPKs, the distance they're travelling, you know, the, or is it by total passenger number? So you would have someone like... Ryanair, which is you know massively huge passenger airline operation, but because it flies short haul, it, you know it would be in the among the ten biggest in terms of passenger numbers mm. flown. But in terms of RPKs, which is which takes into effect how far people are flying, mm. um, it, it wouldn't figure there at all. And, and likewise in in revenue, because it's because it's a, a low cost carrier by definition, charging. Yeah low fares <laughs> it can move a lot of people but the mm. uh, but the revenues don't necessarily but from a profit perspective they've always been yeah. even though their profits sure. are down slightly profits are obviously i think the metric i find the uh, the most interesting uh, um mm. in terms i think you can gauge the success of the industry or how it's going and, and one of the measures i've been following quite closely is and this is a, a totally arbitrary. It just looks quite good, um, <laughs> but it's the number of carriers that, that or, or airline groups that are making operating profits of more than a billion dollars a year, mm-hmm. which is, it, you know, it, you're talking a billion dollar. You know, it may still be, um, you might be making a billion on revenues of twenty billion, and that's only like a, a margin mm-hmm. of five percent, or the, the margins are slightly higher. So they're not huge profit levels, but by what is historically not a particularly profitable industry, mm. uh, these are really good times. Um, now the number there are there were seventeen um, operating groups across the world uh, last year that did that, which is down slightly from um, twenty, which is the record the previous year. Right. Um, and what's I think is quite interesting actually that uh, you know five five of them in, in in North America, five in Europe, six in Asia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Emirates as well, so one in uh, the Middle East, and you know it's actually quite a balanced picture. Mm. Profits as a when when you look at where the profits come for this industry, the North American car- carriers, you know, ov- overall um, provide a lot of those profits. You know, the bulk mm. of the industry profits when IATA gives its profit figures, it will be around half of it will be North American. Um, but when you look at those top level mm. operators, you have in each region you have you know, a series of very successful carriers. I think the problem of the challenges in Asia, the challenges in Europe and, and in, in other regions is that you also have a, a lot of struggling carriers. Yes, and you've yeah. seen that in Europe with, uh, and in fact in, in Asia mm. with the number of um, airline casualties that you get there, which isn't something you see in North America at all. Mm. No, it's good. And I think um, we there's definitely a sense, obviously, that we've peaked in terms of the profits and it's on the downside if... if quite slowly it's slow at the moment that that kind of progress but um so d- definitely um it's, it's always fascinating to look through that list and see how things have changed and and certainly i think next year we might be looking at yeah a, even a more, much more challenging even more challenges and yeah there are lots of ceos talking about um that they expect to see more airlines fall over in europe for example in in the coming months so um yeah it's been a fascinating time but certainly um, well worth checking out those um, those rankings, not just because of the, the hours and hours and hours you put into them, but they are they're a great way of get a kind of health check and just yeah, like you say, it's fascinating to look at carriers and and how they they feature differently in the in the different metrics in those rankings. So yeah, so um, have a look at um, airline business July August and um, and our online channels for that that information. And we'll have more in part three. For more information on airline business, including your subscription options, go to flightglobal.com forward slash airline business. Walter Cho is the third generation of the family to lead Korean Air, having taken over in April following the sudden death of his father. Ellis Taylor interviewed Cho during last month's IATA AGM in Seoul for airline business, and I caught up with Ellis to find out the big challenges ahead for the new man in charge at Korean. 
Yeah, so uh, Walter Cho arguably uh, was born to run Korean Air, uh, and he's sort of the third generation of the Cho family now to be running at the top, uh, having taken over in April uh, after the untimely death of his father, Cho Yang Ho. Uh, so, but it is a position that he uh, really has been training for for a long time. Uh, he's been working at Korean Air since 2004. Uh, in the last few years, has been the president of the airline, has, has been involved in some quite major decisions around fleet and some of the partnerships of Korean Air. So he doesn't come to it, uh, you know, completely green. He comes with a, a great amount of experience and knows the airline quite well. So you get the sense that uh, you know, this transition, uh, whilst sudden and a little bit unexpected, uh, has been quite smooth and he's really uh, taking the helm there, at this carrier, as it celebrates its 50th year. And, and is there an element in which, I suppose, the, the new generation was sort of move Korean on, which I guess is quite a conservative carrier. Yeah, certainly. Uh, when I spoke with Walter, he uh, was very strong and, and talking about, uh, you know, how he has brings a bit more of a, a relaxed management style. Um, you know, Korean companies on the whole tend to be uh, quite conservative and uh, have a lot of power distance between employees. Uh, he's trying to take a different tack, uh, probably reflecting his, his U.S. college education of trying to engage, particularly with his senior management team, more having things like an open door policy, uh, and actually sort of working at the uh, at the ground level uh, with his staff to uh, get them to embody um, Korean Air a little bit more. Um, yeah, th those are all pretty standard practices uh, in the West, but you know, in Korea that doesn't happen as much, and so in some ways it looks like he's at least attempting to bring a, a breath of fresh air through what is traditionally quite a conservative company. And it's an interesting time for Korean. Obviously, they've they've had this kind of on-off cooperation with Delta Airlines, which is very much on now. Absolutely. And uh, Walter's been quite involved with that. Uh, he sort of said that things really uh, kicked off in 2016 when Ed Bastian became the CEO of Delta. Uh, prior to that, we'd sort of seen uh, Korean and Delta having a relationship, but it, it appeared to be that Delta was trying to force Korean Air into a joint venture and uh, the Korean partner wasn't so keen on that. Um, and, and sort of Walter gave a, a bit of a knowing uh, quote when he said that there were some issues before. Um, but, you know, in the first year of operations, that's delivered for them quite strongly. They've delivered new routes. They're making more profits on the Trans-Pacific routes. Uh, and, and, you know, really, they've sort of what he has said is that effectively all of the things that were in the past are kind of water under the bridge now that the benefits from that are flowing. So, you know, it's really hard to uh, understate just how transformative that alliance has been for Korean Air. And in some ways, I think really it's kind of setting the template for any future cooperation where they choose to go down the joint venture path. They're very much a carrier that's open to working with their Sky Team partners uh, and opening other code shares. But I think really they now have a good understanding of how to do joint ventures well. Uh, that's not to say that they're out necessarily to sign up joint ventures everywhere, but I think they've got a base to explore from now and they've seen the benefits of that. Uh, and I, I think sort of over the medium term, uh, we might see them reach out to, to look at joint ventures with other carriers in other markets. And Korea is a, a country where, where we've seen low-cost carriers uh, taking an increasing sort of grip and and hold of, uh, of parts of markets there and, and expanding very rapidly. What's Korean Air's approach or strategy been to dealing with that? Korean Air has been quite interesting. They, they've tended to be quite hands-off when it's come to the uh, Korean budget market. Um, they did have a guiding hand in founding Jin Air, but they no longer hold a stake in that. Uh, it's still controlled by their parent company, Hanjin. Um, but we've seen in the meantime the rise of carriers like Jeju Air, TUA Air uh, and E-Star Jet sort of really uh, ramp up in particularly the short haul budget market. Uh, and we've got at least two new budget carriers who are going to be regionally based, uh, but also one new hybrid carrier in Air Premier coming into the market uh, who have stated that they want to fly long haul, that they're going to offer low fares and comfort. And really, that's what's sort of starting to ring alarm bells at Korean Air. And we've seen Walter has sort of said that, uh, you know, we in the past that we haven't really taken on the competition, but he's planning to do that. And interestingly, he's stated that he wants to do that with Korean Air. Uh, rather than maybe using Jin Air and expanding that onto uh, onto different routes. So it'll be interesting to see how he responds to the new threat uh, of a new long-haul carrier potentially starting up next year. So it looks like he's got plenty on his plate. Alice Taylor, thanks for your help.
My pleasure. So that's all for this time. You can find the links to the stories we've referenced in the podcast notes. And if you've enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. We'll be back again in August. In the meantime, you can stay up to date on breaking airline news stories at flyglobal.com. See you next time.